Here is the whirlwind version. What I have found in working with uh, large groups that want to do online organizing is that there are a few major stumbling blocks. Number one, big category, strategy, the biggest thing, uh, I'll cross out the little things, is the difference between an inside power strategy and an outside power strategy. A lot of groups have an inside power strategy, which means they think their route to change is keeping doors open to decision makers through good relationships, providing them good information about a problem, and then getting those decision makers to act on the basis of that sound information. That's fine. It works sometimes. It works if you have friendly decision makers. The problem is the outside power strategy is a very different theory. It's based on having enough people that even if the door closes, you can knock it down in a democracy because you have enough support. Where these things come in conflict is that in order to sustain a large enough grassroots force to execute the outside power strategy, you often have to say things that the insiders don't like. Like, for example, how do they actually vote on that budget resolution that you were campaigning on or that human rights resolution? or what was in a speech that you did or didn't like. Now that might close the door on the insiders, the lobbyists, the access people, because the decision makers have been offended that you emailed your list and held them accountable. So the inside power strategy will try to, people in the organization, will try to stop your outside power strategy people from having that kind of honest dialogue with your base because they're worried about the door closing. So how do we deal with this? Um, my, uh, it, it's tricky, it's hard. A lot of these organizations are very rooted in the in, inside Insider strategy. The number uh, one argument that I have used and I believe in about this question is the question of long term strategy, which is that the insider access strategy of saying whatever you need to to keep the door open to the decision makers only works when you have decision makers who want to listen to you and will be moved by your arguments. That can change and does change with every administration and every election over time. The one thing that we can really be sure of is if we build a powerful constituency for our issues that have the power to knock down the door then whomever is elected will be that much more likely or uh, required to listen to our agenda. So it is an investment in the long term, even if it comes with short-term sacrifice of doors being closed in our face. And I would say that it is necessary to have the authentic dialogue with your base that does occasionally offend the insiders in order to give them uh, enough of an investment and feeling of empowerment for them to really stick with you and build and become that effective outside fighting force. So the long-term strategy of change, of how things really change in society, is the number one argument that I would use uh, in discussing with an organization the trade-offs of the insider versus the outsider power strategy. Um, the other thing is mission alignment. Then most of our groups, even if we have an insider strategy, it's much more aligned with our purpose, our core, our DNA to build grassroots power and to wield it and to have that be our primary instrument of influencing society. And so the lobbyists and the people who have done this their whole lives, very well-meaning, very good intentioned people, they're only trying to change the world in the way that they know how, but uh, if, if it's really understood that there's this trade-off oftentimes in communication styles and content between insider and outsider, and the, it, it will, I think, be generally understood, if you put it in these terms, that the mission alignment with the core, the soul, the purpose of the organization is more with the investment in the outsider strategy. So some, some theoretical stuff up there. I hope that makes sense. That's big point number one. Um, so the rest of this stuff is a little bit more structural. Challenges that you face doing online organizing within a larger context. So one is nimbleness. To do effective online organizing, as we've seen, you need to respond rapidly and with urgency. Big organizations have a lot of decision-making layers. It's hard uh, for them. How do, you, how do you deal with that? Stakeholder issue. Big organizations often have other stakeholders. So we talk about member service, serving the interests of your list. Well, there's other interests that these big organizations want to serve, like the board members, like coalition members, like celebrities that we rely on to you know, do events and get the word out, or like allies in Congress or whatever. So how do we, how do we deal with the stakeholder problem. And then the sort of the org chart issue. Often the internet is added as an adjunct to communications or God help us sometimes to like IT or the technical department. And then it's made to serve the interests of those department heads and their agenda and their way of doing business. And that doesn't really work. It works a little bit sometimes in some cases of overlap, but often not. So how do we address that? 
Okay, so here are some practical arguments I think you can make within your organizations to try to change some of this structural stuff around. So uh, the first one is I call help me help us. And what this is really about is explaining the ways in which effective online organizing can uh, contribute tangible value to the organization. Uh, on a presidential campaign, unfortunately, a lot of it comes down to dollars and cents. Uh, and that might be true for a lot of your organizations as well. So there's obviously the argument around direct fundraising. Let me do my job the best way I know how and I can raise the most money for you. If we can grow following these principles of nimbleness and da 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 da, we can have a big list, we can fundraise from it. That's sort of obvious. But another point that people often forget to make is the opportunity mm, fundraising that you can do by outsourcing things to a well-honed, large, and active online base that you normally pay for as an organization. So right now I'm working with SEIU, Service Employees International Union in the United States. They pay a lot of money to have people make phone calls to their members to get them to do things, vote or join an organization or whatever. They now understand that they can, if they had a large online constituency, they could get those people to make the same phone calls for free. Cha-ching! Suddenly, each one of those phone calls is worth a dollar fifty to them. And you get half a million phone calls or 10,000 phone calls and you're talking about a lot of money. It's a way for them to quantify the value of the list that they hadn't thought about and it's really changing the way they do business. Um, you can think about crowdsourcing design. A lot of us pay a lot of money for design, for logos, pamphlets, brochures. Most of the people on our list, I mean a lot of people on our list are really creative. A lot of design people, you can outsource those sorts of projects, often works very well. Uh, rich media, same thing. We make ads, we make television spots, we make radio spots. That's another thing you can creatively outsource. Uh, Move On has had a lot of success with outsourcing uh, commercials. Bush in 30 seconds, huge thing in 2004, amazing quality stuff. We would have paid at least $100,000 uh, just for the content for the top 10 ads and we just did it by sending out an email asking people to do it themselves. Um, Field, we often pay a lot of money for field contacts. You can, with a well-developed network, outsource that. Uh, and research. Uh, when Harriet Myers was nominated to the Supreme Court by George Bush, you hopefully don't remember her because she didn't win, but the big question was who the heck is Harriet Myers? She was Bush's uh, personal lawyer for a long time and then his lawyer in the White House. So we could have paid a lot of money and a lot of uh, uh, professional researchers to help us figure this out and make our case. Instead, we outsourced the research. We literally sent out to the whole list and said, who is Harriet Myers? Help us figure it out. Do research online, do research in libraries, submit here, and then sign up to be a volunteer to screen the research. Research. We had three levels of volunteer screening. We'd look at the argument, rate it according to its usefulness and the credibility of it according to the source provided. And if it went through all three levels of screening, it went into our dossier, we gave it to our coalition, boom, $50,000 worth of research done in 48 hours by about 5,000 people uh, for free. Uh, so the opportunity cost of what you can save your organization through effective crowdsourcing of resources, a very strong argument uh, for getting the priority that you need to do your job the way you want to do it. A couple of other quick practical arguments. Um, so the internet is not a technical thing. Very important. It uses technology, relies on technology, but the internet is fundamentally, in my view, no more a technical thing than communications work. Traditional press communications work is a typewriter thing and therefore a mechanical thing and therefore should be under the department of the typewriter manufacturers. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Now, we all, of course, rely on tools um, uh, and we need them and they're integral. Uh, but the decision making about which tools to use and how to use them and how to design them is about strategy. It's about knowing people. It's about organizing. That's a critical point and it can just be made at face value. I've used the typewriter analogy a couple times and it usually works. Um, important to remember, the people on your list are not the general public. Often the communications department will craft the messages that you're able to send out as if you were broadcasting to the universe on a blimp that was flying above London. That's not what's happening. You're communicating to your supporters. And communications, per se, is usually the wrong objective for online engagement. Uh, because communications is about putting a message in front of as many people as possible to move them or inform them or whatever. You're usually dealing with your constituency of people who are converted and interested and you're trying to mobilize them to do stuff. It's much more about organizing generally than it is about straight communications. Even if the objective is communications, ultimately, you're mobilizing your supporters to help you with the communications by writing letters to the editor or talking to their friends or whatever. But your message to them is different than your message to anyone out there at all. And that's a key distinction that is often missed, particularly when the internet ends up under the communications department. Uh, so mobilization versus communications and, and being different, key, key, key. Um, 
pound for pound, really good argument, just in terms of the amount of staff it takes and resources it takes for the internet to do its job versus other departments. You just have an efficiency argument that is really good to make internally. One last thing, diffusing the nutcase fear. A lot of times internet departments are corralled what you're allowed to do, how you're allowed to organize, uh, the degree to which you're allowed uh, to have public input on a blog, on local events, on whatever, is constrained by a abiding fear of the nutcase who will do something crazy and ruin your organization. Uh, and uh, we've, all, we've all met them. They do come to our events. They wear way too many buttons. Sometimes uh, they wear suits when no one else is and you're like, okay, what are you trying to prove? A little weird. Uh, but I can tell you this. I've worked with organizations that have uh, lots of enemies who would do anything to destroy us. And we have been very, very open and comments and people publicly representing the organization unofficially as volunteers, but still with move on paraphernalia like everywhere for years in highly contentious, highly polarized environments where there are well financed opposition research teams that are trying to destroy us at every turn. You know, not so much the case for Amnesty or Oxfam or like those sorts of groups. I mean, you got your enemies, but you know, we're talking about like, whew. And uh, there's been two, exactly two incidents in 10 years of move on history that have had any significant negative impact on the organization from the nutcase factor. And we both, you know, simple best practices could have controlled either of them. There was a video that compared Bush to Hitler that got us in a little trouble for a while. And there were some anti-Semitic comments. We didn't make it, a member made it. And there was, uh, and there were some anti-Semitic comments on a, on, a, on a forum and it became a, a thing. But say a little bit of a little bit of a press story, just like any press story where we get attacked 18 times a day for the things we intend to say and want to defend. Uh, didn't take a lot of time and 1,000 million billion percent worth it in terms of the value that we're able to get out of empowering people to speak to the media in local environments on issues or communicate with each other horizontally and publicly on our web infrastructure. So diffusing the nutcase fear, uh, and you can use that as an example if you want, but diffusing the nutcase fear is one of the best things you can do to sort of free yourself just by challenging people to really examine what are they afraid of is there real evidence to think that's going to happen. Truth is, there are probably isn't. So I think in a whirlwind fashion, those are, oh, last point, the stakeholders. We talked about the stakeholders, the celebrities, the, the coalition partners, da, 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 and they have different interests. They're concerned about messaging. Da, da, da. One of the best things you can do, this is often not done, but I find, I've seen it done a couple of times and it really works. Sit down with the stakeholders and just explain to them the difference between your online messaging. I mean, like, so with the John Edwards campaign, we were doing all this stuff about small dollar donations and the fat cats and da, 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 and the finance team was like, uh, you know, we have, we have some fat cats and you know, they like giving us lots of money. And, and so we thought, well, hey, why don't we just like explain on a conference call to like some of our top donors uh, why this uh, why it's so important for us to talk about the importance of small dollar donation? Turns out they didn't they totally got it. They were cool. Uh, they felt respected by the organization by the campaign. Um, so talking to your celebrities, your your uh, your coalition partners, your board members, whatever. If they've got qualms, or you think they've got qualms, or your management thinks they've got qualms about what you would like to do online, just go run through this with them. How much you can save on phone calls and field and crowdsourcing of uh, materials and what the, the potential for growth that you can have and what that would do, I bet, you can, I bet you can bring them around. At least it's worth trying. And if you haven't and you find that as a constraint, give it a shot. So that's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.